Back, Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program Yochai Benkler. He is a uh, professor from Harvard Law, the Berkman Professor of Entrepreneurial Legal Studies uh, there, author of uh, multiple books, including his most recent with, uh, with co-authors, uh, Network Propaganda, Manipulation, Disinformation, and Radicalization in American Politics. Uh, welcome to the program. Thanks very much. Happy to be with you. So um, let, I, I want to start, um, uh, I guess let's start with just the, the, um, the methodology of the research that, that offers the, the, that provides the foundation for the book. And then I, I want to uh, start with the history before we get to what your research found. But, but just give us a sense of what kind of research um, uh, you were doing uh, that, that, that formed the basis of this uh, book. So we at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard, with our colleagues at the Center for Civic Media at MIT, have been developing a platform to analyze media ecosystems generally, using very large data analysis. Essentially, we scrape and collect millions of stories, about a million stories a day from around the world, and we build it into a system that then allows us to search for more stories on a given topic, put them in a database, and allow us to uh, analyze uh, millions of stories, how they link to each other, what text they use on which day, how they are tweeted, how they are shared on Facebook, or at least how often they're shared on Facebook. Um, and with these materials, we then also add case studies where we do a deep dive into a particular topic, look at how television covered it using the Internet Archive, uh, uh, TV Web Archive. Um, and this particular study, this particular book, is based on analyzing 4 million stories from April of 2015 until the first anniversary of the Trump presidency. Have very heavy focus on the presidential election it, uh, up until the election, and then more broadly on national politics uh, since then. And this, um, this dynamic... Um, is not well. All right, let's let's go to let's cut to the quick in terms of the the broad strokes. In the course of your research, you essentially found that there are two um, large subsets of of media consumers within politics: um, the right and the and, the, and essentially the the center and the left as as the second one. Tell us what the distinctions are between those two subsets. So what we found is even more than just that the consumers are in two separate groups, but that the producers, too, are in two separate groups. So when you look at how media producers link to each other, that's to say this has nothing to do with Facebook, nothing to do with Twitter. It's only I'm writing a story, I'm publishing it online, I'm linking to other stories. This is something about how I, as the producer, and deciding who I give authority to, who I give credit to, and who I don't. And we also used how often uh, sites were tweeted together. So, for example, if I'm somebody who tweeted a story from the New York Times and tweeted a story from the Washington Post on the same day, our network analysis would make the New York Post, uh, the New York Times, and the Washington Post close to each other. If I tweet Breitbart and Fox News on the same day, then Fox News and Breitbart will be on the same day. And that shows us the consumer side, what they're paying attention to. What we saw, both when we analyzed open internet, web-based linking, and when we looked at Twitter, and when we looked at Facebook, and even when we focused on text and how who uses similar text, what we saw was a repeated pattern. The right wing going from Fox and the New York Post all the way to uh, uh, Alex Jones and Infowar and Gateway Pundit and Truth Feed and True Pundit and the craziest conspiracy sites all have a single network. There are single insular networks where the producers link mostly to each other and the consumers read mostly that. 
By contrast, we didn't see anything parallel on the left. Instead, what we saw was all the way from relatively historically conservative center-right, at least editorially, uh, uh, publications like the Wall Street Journal, all the way to mobilized networks publication like Daily Cost or historical left-leaning publications like um, uh, Mother Jones, are all actually part of the same media ecosystem. They're all anchored in traditional media. They all link primarily to traditional media, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, uh, etc. They all, their audiences also have a much more diverse media diet, and they read much more broadly across from left to center. So we don't really see a symmetric polarization where the left and right are each going off in its own way. What we see is that the right has spun off into its own insular system, and the West has essentially become a single media ecosystem. And there's almost no center-right. There are almost no publications that you would today, historically were right, but today would you consider center-right, National Review, Weekly Standard, um, uh, basically get no attention. Um, Alex Jones today has a bigger audience than any of these historically conservative publications. There is no center right. There's just a right and the rest. And so what what are I mean, let, let's let's talk about the implications of of the the the, the narrowness of the the media, I guess, diet and network. So both from a consumer and a production side, the narrowness of of the right. Let's talk about the implications of that first before we get in or maybe it's easier to talk about it the implications relative to the diversity on the center center left. Essentially what we saw uh both in general in the structure and when we dug into specific case studies was that the right operated on what we came to call the propaganda feedback loop. That is to say, each of the outlets on the right has to compete on ideological purity and being and feeding its audience more identity and bias confirming news. Whereas nobody on the right has any incentive and in fact is strongly incentivized against saying, no, that's false. Actually, that's going too far. Let's be a little moderate. So... What you don't see at all on the right is competition that is moderated by fact-checking and reality-checking. The, the only way to differentiate yourself is to continue to be loyal to the identity-confirming narratives and to criticize others who step out of line. What we saw in the rest of the media ecosystem, including on the left, is that even when a crazy conspiracy theory did take root for a little while, because the audience pays attention to, to such a diverse set of media, because the media that get the most attention operate on a journalistic model that is fact-checking constrained, because even many of the outlets that are left-oriented operate in that journalistic model, the conspiracies don't survive long, and instead there's a tension between, on one hand, trying to get audiences by uh, confirming their biases, which happens on the left as well, and on the other hand, not going too far out of line from what's reality, because then you get criticized from other sites uh, uh, that the left pays attention to. So the right operates purely on a propaganda feedback loop where they only repeat the same bias-confirming truths and nobody tries to constrain the other. Whereas on the left, you see a tension between efforts to confirm people's biases and make them feel good about the news, and at the same time being constrained by the fact that everybody still focuses on a reality check dynamic. And we should say that this not only applies, I mean, to the, the media outlets themselves, but also to, theoretically, to the politicians, right? I mean, because they end up being, um, you know, in, in the, 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 all of the, I guess, the actors within 
what you could consider sort of the conservative world or the center center left world. So when I'm, you know, even if I'm speaker of the house, I, I've got to deal with essentially Fox news and everything that's around it. So I also have to, the, all of my incentives are to at the very least either be quiet or to actively confirm and support these sort of other narratives. That's absolutely right. And, and again, we see this in the data. Essentially, think of it as a, as a three-way um, uh, interaction. Media outlets want audiences, and the audience gets attention, brings attention by enjoying the stories that confirm their beliefs. Politicians want audiences, and they want to confirm their beliefs because they also are attracted. Now, if the media outlets will always support and amplify what a politician who only says what audiences want to hear uh, does, is that that politician gets airtime. A politician that says, you know what, that's going too far, that's not true, um, will at best lose attention and lose their audience and their media outlets, and at worst be vilified and actually have the news outlets um, um, attack them for being um, um, too soft, as it were. And so essentially you have this three-way network of audiences, police media outlets, media outlets, police each other, and police politicians to all toe the party line. Instead, what you have with the rest of the media ecosystem that covers the center, center left and left, is that the outlets identify politicians who are lying and criticize them as well. Um, the politicians who want to compete on being reality-based actually have an audience that can tell the difference between truth and fiction rather than just between what fits and doesn't fit the party line. So the politicians face completely different media and audience incentives on the left than on the right. The outlets face completely different incentives and sources of discipline, and the audiences therefore face a completely different media ecosystem. And on the right, there's simply reinforcement of towing the party line and competing on who can do it in a more pure and extreme way. Whereas on the left, you get this balance between trying to appeal to your uh, voters' preferences, but at the same time being constrained by a media ecosystem that will hold you to the facts of what you say. So what 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 accounts for this difference? I mean, I, this is because and, and I think I mean, the, I mean, is it is it simply I mean, what accounts from, from to the extent that you have a sense, what accounts for this difference? So the first thing that we need to learn from this difference is that most of current debates about what's happened to American political media has focused on technology, whether it's the Facebook algorithm or fake news clickbait uh, uh, spammers, or whether it's uh, uh, Russian bots, uh, or, or most of the stories, whichever they were, had a strong technological component. Because both of these populations are actually at the same technological frontier. And in fact, if you look at youth surveys, people on the left are younger generally and therefore use the technology more, whereas people on the right depend more heavily on traditional media like television and radio. Um, you can't keep blaming the technology. That's not where most of the action is. Instead, you need to look at a story that you can't find from our data. And in the book, what we do is we step away from the data and we start looking at the history of the last 50 years of media policy, of political culture, of technology. And the story we tell actually has very little to do with Facebook's algorithm and a lot to do with what allowed Rush Limbaugh Right. to invent the outrage industry as a major new business model that makes millions. 
And so, I mean, let's 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 talk about that, because, you know, having been a I guess an AM talk radio uh, vet uh, that entered into this in many respects to specifically deal with Rush Limbaugh at a time, you know, when YouTube did not exist, when Facebook was something that just like college kids maybe, you know, vaguely knew uh, Twitter did not exist at that time. This was the dynamic the, the in some respects. To the extent that we had a precursor to social media, radio, talk radio was it in many respects. So, uh, I, I mean, I think people uh, are familiar with what happened with the Fairness Doctrine being rolled back. It allowed for uh, Rush Limbaugh to go on three hours a day. But what else was it? What, why? Why did the right adopt that model and the left never really pursued it or was it i mean how conscious of a of an activity was it by the right to pursue this so i think there are um several elements that we explain uh in the chapter on the origins of asymmetry in the book um and first of all uh there's a component that has to do with the political realignment of the Republican Party. Essentially, after 68, with the adoption of the Southern strategy, you see a shift of a strong component of the Republican coalition becoming a white identity audience that is captured within the Republican Party because it's rejecting the civil rights movement. Then in the 70s, you see evangelical Christians who were uh, present but not politically mobilized, being mobilized by the success of the women's movement to protect a traditional patriarchal family and resulting in the rise of the moral majority. These two audiences, the Christian evangelicals who got into it through televangelism and the Christian broadcasting network that was the third most watched uh, radio network in the 1980s, um, uh, and uh, Christian broadcasting alongside Rush Limbaugh and talk radio um, uh, created a base of, um, of within the audience that was a large coherent group that provided a commercial audience for this model. The second thing that happened is that in 1996, in addition to the repeal in 1987 of the Fairness Doctrine that you mentioned, in 1996 there was also repeal of group ownership rules that allowed Clear Channel to emerge as a major player in radio, that allowed Sinclair to emerge as a major player in broadcasting, companies whose names you don't really know, but that actually, in the case of Clear Channel, owned stations from coast to coast, including buying uh, uh, the producer of Rush Limbaugh, Glenn Beck, uh, Hannity on radio. So now you essentially have a seamless network of radio stations, coast to coast, practically 24 hours a day, selling this outrage and hatred as a, a, a form of candy, essentially. It makes you feel good about your identity if you agree with it, and you tune into it, and it draws you in, and it make, gives you a sense of community in this base anchor. So the right moved early, the right relied on deregulation and the emergence of technologies of abundance, be they AM, ra AM radio first, then increased channel capacity, and later on the Internet, to harvest the benefits from this new audience. On the left, you had, uh, first of all, the fact that the right moved first meant that traditional journalistic outlets also gave political confirmations to people on the left. The more that the right was stuck in its propaganda and feedback loop, the more just telling things how they are already reinforces you as somebody who's left uh, in your beliefs, because now you're getting all of the benefit of mainstream journalism turning toward um, um, the, the right and saying that's false. So that was one element, the fact that the right was a first mover, it's entirely possible, at least in theory, that had the left moved first, it would have been uh, reversed. Um, the other thing is that the coalition on the left is much more diverse and doesn't have this very large coherent center of white identity and Christian 
uh, uh, voters, and instead has, so if you look at radio, uh, black communities are largely considered a market uh, of their own. Latinx communities are largely considered uh, of their own. NPR is largely a highly journalistic organization, but with an editorial tilt or a feel uh, that serves uh, uh, and reinforces left uh, beliefs in that regard, more like the Wall Street Journal, obviously, than like Fox. Um, so for somebody like Air America to come along, for MSNBC to suddenly rechange its um, um, practices in 2006, uh, they're already competing with, for an audience that is getting some of its partisan kicks simply from truth-seeking journalism, they're aiming for a much more broad and diverse audience without the same core of what uh, uh, provides the bread and butter of the right-wing media. And by the time the Internet sites come along, uh, on the right, the outrage industry has been uh, around for 20 years. The audience knows what to expect. You can't compete anywhere else. On the left, it becomes much harder to compete completely separate from reality, and instead we see this more constrained uh, partisanship, even from outlets that try to be more partisan.